Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. In the first three parts of this presentation, physicist Eugene Bagashov has presented the ongoing analysis he and several colleagues are conducting into the presence of Birkeland currents within the Milky Way galaxy and close to our solar system. This includes evidence that the so-called local interstellar chimney, where our solar system is situated, may represent a giant plasma filament. In this conclusion, Eugene presents his and his colleagues' analysis of Birkeland currents within the solar system, including the possible role of these currents in catastrophic events, both in the past and perhaps one day in the future. Let us now turn our attention to even smaller scales, the solar system itself, we might assume, based on the previous analysis, that our system is also traveling along the plasma current of an according scale, which is a subfilament on the local interstellar cloud scale. So there might be some evidence for that which we might extract to compare their observations with this hypothesis. Perhaps the evidence to be presented below would be too vague and also quite controversial, but I believe that it should be at least present in the EU and plasma universe considerations. After all, even if it's not right itself, it still might spark some other more viable ideas. So one of the ideas that has been researched for quite a while by the so-called Binary Research Institute is that the Sun should have a companion star, perhaps Sirius, and they are bound gravitationally. In that way, they were able to explain some of the downfalls of the current theory of the precession of the Earth's spin axis. Without getting into too much detail, let's just state that one of the hypotheses that follows from that, and seems to be supported by observational evidence, is that it's not the Earth's spin axis that precesses, but rather the solar system as a whole. After all, the precession is determined by the change in relative positions of the Sun and distant stars at certain position of Earth in its orbit around the Sun. So if it's not the Earth's axis that changes with respect to stars, but the whole system, including Earth and the Sun, the result with respect to the distant stars might be the same. So in this regard, Jim Weninger believes, and I also think this hypothesis is viable, that it's not some gravitational interaction with Sirius or some other object that causes this, but rather the interaction of the Sun with larger scale plasma structures, such as the hypothetical filament. The solar system might still be connected to that filament and be traveling along it. In this case, we might assume that it's the relative orientation of this filament with respect to distant stars is what determines the precession. One might assume even that this filament is one of the pair of interacting filaments which would make the precession cyclical. If the filaments wind around each other just like the double helix nebula does, we would observe periodic rotation of the celestial sphere, which, if we ignore the other bodies in the solar system, would be equivalent to the precession of our spin axis. Moreover, if one takes into account the periodicity of precession, which is about 26,000 years or so, it would be seen that it's the same order of magnitude as the recent ice ages on Earth. Perhaps they are also caused by this external forcing, whether by its impact on the Earth directly or perhaps on the Sun. Moreover, we might hypothesize that the same filament would create preferential shells where the planetary orbits would lie. One important caveat should be made here, though. At the moment, it seems that the electromagnetism and gravity should act together here. I know there are theories that gravity is just a consequence of electromagnetism in the first place. That might be the case, but that way or another, for the sake of this argument, I'd consider them as separate forces. So the idea is that the electromagnetism, in the form of plasma filaments in this case, determines all the possible types of stable orbits of planets, and then only those orbits are actually observed that would satisfy the gravitational dynamics too. One of the pieces of evidence for such shell-like structure of plasma in the solar system is the Voyager 2 spacecraft measurements of solar wind parameters at various distances from the Sun. If you look at the graph for solar wind speed, for example, you'd see a clear pattern of repeating peaks and troughs, especially prominent somewhere from 20 to about 50 astronomical units. Perhaps that is an artifact due to the changing solar cycles and the migration of coronal holes that progressed as the probe was going out, but since the launch of the probe only four solar cycles have passed, which is not enough to get such a dense forest of peaks. Another interesting evidence might be found right at the orbit of Earth. 
This paper in particular shows that there exists a large-scale background magnetic field in the solar system that doesn't seem to be directly connected to the interplanetary magnetic field associated with the solar wind. In particular, this background field does not co-rotate with the Sun. But perhaps most importantly, the researchers have found that there is a non-zero azimuthal component of this magnetic field, meaning that in a way, at least at the range of one astronomical unit from the Sun, it represents a closed magnetic loop spanning the whole orbit of Earth. The authors conclude that the current that would produce such a field, i.e. the current inside this loop, should be of the order of giga amperes, that is 10 to the power of 9 amperes. This seems to correspond to Don Scott's model really well, in my opinion. And who knows how much current would be there if you make such a measurement at even larger scales. So perhaps the orbital characteristics of planets, such as the orbital inclination, for example, might be influenced by the impact of this larger filament, and maybe even their spin axis orientations. If the planet in an elliptical orbit moves closer and farther away from the Sun, it might encounter various areas of a larger Birkeland current, and these areas might have slightly different directions of the magnetic field and current strength, as follows from Dr. Scott's model. At the moment, it's a hypothesis, as the exact properties of the filament are unknown. I've been studying the geometry of the solar system for some time, but its alignment to larger structures, especially on the scale of the local interstellar cloud, is hard to determine precisely at the moment, but we are working on it. Another point to consider would be the enhancement of the electric comet model in order to introduce the possible impact of the quasi-cylindrical geometry of the Birkeland current filament in addition to the quasi-spherical geometry of the electric sun. Such models have been around for quite a while, but I don't think their implications for the electric comet received much attention. Perhaps the solar cycles of activity might be related to larger scale plasma properties. If we assume, for example, that it's not the Sun itself that is the center of the filament, but rather a solar system barycenter, the center of mass, it would be clear that as the planets tug the Sun back and forth with respect to it, our star would be periodically exposed to the areas of slightly different current density and magnetic field strength. This might also potentially explain the magnetic pole reversals that happen each 11 years on the Sun, which roughly corresponds to the orbital period of Jupiter, the main perturber of the Sun's motion. Looking at the planets themselves, we might assume that they also receive smaller scale plasma filaments, which we actually observe. These currents not only produce auroras, but as Don Scott has shown, might correspond to the layers of counter-rotating winds at different latitudes. This doesn't seem to be limited to the polar areas only, as could be seen on Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn, such layering occurs even at lower latitudes. Arguably, these planets have strong magnetic fields, so maybe such behavior of Birkeland currents is the consequence of that, rather than intrinsic for the larger scale filament. But that way or another, we see a clear correlation of Don Scott's model and real observable wind speeds and directions. Perhaps another important piece of evidence of the impact of interstellar plasma filaments might have been recorded right here on Earth. I mean, in the stories that our ancestors have been telling. It is not impossible that the civilizations that have lived on this planet before us have had some knowledge about the way skies worked, and that's why they've been so obsessed with keeping the precise astronomical records, at least as precise as was possible. I'm talking about the Yuga cycles of ancient India, the Mayan long solar cycles, and other evidence like that. If these people have been around long enough to observe the actual changes that these long-term processes were bringing, it's not surprising that they came up with the idea of such long cycles. The book Hamlet's Mill by De Santillana and Dehent contains a lot of relevant stories that might shed some light on that. Here again I have to mention Pleiades, as they seem to be one good example. Ancient traditions from Borneo Island call the Pleiades Whirlpool Island, where the Whirlpool, also an important concept in other traditions, might be associated with the toroidal structure of the Gould's Belt. And there are many other interesting examples like that. In a way, I think we might say that this is the most natural extension of Velikovskian catastrophism. Velikovsky and many of his followers concentrate on the catastrophes in the past of the solar system, which would mean some sudden abrupt changes, reorganizing the whole system into a different state. But what if that was not a singular catastrophe or even series of catastrophes? 
we might hypothesize that planetary chaos and other phenomena of that sort might be introduced due to the impact of larger scale processes, like the ones related to these cosmic filaments we are discussing now. And it might happen periodically. It seems that, roughly speaking, a century is the time scale of the solar system, at least with regards to its planets, and tens to hundreds of millions of years is the time scale of the galaxy, as it is related to our motion around it. But the intermediate zone, from about 1,000 to perhaps a million years, would be the time scale of some intermediate object, and the processes that occur in it. A good candidate would be a galactic spiral arm and the various parts of it, such as the local interstellar chimney that we've discussed in detail previously. So in my opinion, this topic deserves attention from the EU community, and as I've noted in the first video about it, it is currently being researched by me, Jim Weininger, David Johnson, and Chris Seeley. We're currently working on the proper mapping of the solar system and nearby stars and other objects and simultaneously developing an extension of Dr. Scott's model for the plasma filaments. You're welcome to join too. It's quite a fascinating journey and many things might be put together on that level. This is one of the manifestations of the strongest part of the EU paradigm, in my opinion, its multidisciplinary character and the ability to forge scattered problems in different areas of knowledge into a solid unifying theory.